So, uh, I actually, um, I knew I was talking to Michael Moriarty yesterday and he said that the audience today would be a bit mixed, so I didn't want to get into too much detail about any specific cancer, but one thing that uh, there has been quite a significant amount of progress on, or we're using this one, in the last uh, few years is prostate cancer. And uh, I suppose when do I get involved is usually, or traditionally, um, when patients have their cancer has been treated, if it's diagnosed on time, and then it relapses. That's usually when I get involved. Although that paradigm is probably changing now. And we can talk about that a little bit as we go along. So you can see here that uh, the incidence of prostate cancer, we have a pointer, I guess. Not working, is it? Anyway, you can see there at the top, the incidence of prostate cancer, very high. Um, and uh, we have the highest rate of diagnosis of prostate cancer in Europe. And um, that's Michael shaking his head there, I think. <laughs> you would have seen a lot. <laughs> and the mortality there, you can see, there are some cancers, if I, ha I don't have a pointer, but there are some cancers like pancreas cancer, you can see here, where the incidence and the mortality are very similar. And, uh, and then there are other cancers where and lung cancer is another one where the incidence and the mortality, you'll see it there a third from the top, um, are not that dissimilar. So what that's telling you is our treatments for these cancers are not great. So, uh, and unfortunately, with lung cancer and pancreas cancer, which Martin and Michael and I know a lot about, is uh, that often by the time it's diagnosed, it's too late to do anything meaningful in terms of trying to cure patients. You can certainly prolong their lives and help their symptoms, but you can't cure them. So then when it comes to prostate cancer, it's a little bit the opposite. What has happened in the last number of years is we have increased the incident, the, our diagnostics very much so, and that's mainly <coughs> through PSA. Oh, we got a pointer. That's great. Thank you. Very good. That's mainly through PSA. PSA testing, it's so easy to do. You just go and have a blood test. And I, I was talking to a group of GPs recently and they were saying that the patients, uh, if they don't mark it down on the form to do when they're doing their blood test, that the patient will often mark it themselves. Um, you're supposed to have a discussion. This is the latest guidelines from the US and from Europe, is that before you check a PSA, you're supposed to have a discussion with the patient about the implications of what will happen if it's up. Because the next, if, if your PSA is elevated for your age, Probably the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to end up getting a biopsy. And there's a significant co complication rate, usually sepsis. So it's not without its uh, problems. But our diagnostic rate has really increased. But the mortality as yet has not reduced. Now internationally, in other countries where PSA screening is a little bit more advanced than it is in Ireland, the mortality has started to go down. But at the cost of treating a lot of patients there, we don't know if we're doing them any good. So we're diagnosing a lot of cancers at a, at a very early stage. And really the question is, will these cancers really ever affect the patient or will they end up dying of something else? But in reality, once you're diagnosed with a cancer, it's very hard to say to that patient, it's a much longer discussion with the patient to say, I don't think you should have any treatment rather than say, oh, you should have radiotherapy or surgery or whatever. So uh, obviously that's a, that's a complicated, uh, discussion. So you can see, of course, we all know this, that the incidence of cancer in Ireland because of the, our aging population is doubling, is in the context of doubling over the next 20 years. And uh, obviously that has significant implications for our health services. And you can see that the, uh, um, the, the incidence of prostate cancer according to the National um, uh, cancer registry, so has increased quite significantly over the last uh, number of years, since 1994, increased, probably doubled. Um, and you can see that's by geographical area, um, doesn't really vary that much, but I think it does vary, where it varies by is by what the number of urologists in, that are in a specific area. Um, if there are more urologists, then probably more di diagnoses. But now we have rapid access clinics uh, have been set up. So I think that probably any disparities in that regard are going to be uh, ironed out over the next few years. Um, and then you can see 
that as with most cancers, that prostate cancer um, tends to be a disease um, uh, of the elderly. And the older you get, unfortunately, the more likely it is you're going to get some form of cancer. And certainly that also holds true for prostate cancer. So by and large, most of the men that we would meet with prostate cancer are in the older age group. Of course, you get your outliers, the younger patients uh, with the bad cancers. But most, most patients are in their 70s and 80s. The other thing is that the, uh, the natural history of prostate cancer, even untreated, and we know this from the years where we didn't have any good treatments, uh, are is that many of the cases, even when they have metastasized, are, 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 can be quite indolent. And that uh, they can people can live with the disease for many years, even with very basic treatments. Um, so you can see that's a survival curve um, for uh, patients with prostate cancer. Um, and probably if you wanted to be a, a, a real optimist, you could say the survival rates of prostate cancer have really increased over the last number of years. Um, but I think that's more to do with the fact that we're diagnosing more of these less aggressive tumours rather than the fact that our treatments have really improved. Okay, so the traditional model for prostate cancer is if you're diagnosed, I'll get my pointer. If you're diagnosed with localised disease, about 80% of patients are diagnosed with localised disease. Um, then if you're fit for treatment, in other words, if you don't have a lot of other illnesses, then it's a decision about what type of local treatment you should have. And typically that could be either radiation treatment or surgery. And they're the two real curative modalities. Now, there are different types of radiation treatment that I'm sure Michael could tell us about. That I won't get into detail on that today. There's more than one. Um, there's brachytherapy, there's external beam, and there are others. Um, but so local treatment, and that will cure about 80% of patients who are treated for cure with localized prostate cancer will be cured by it. So you have 20% who present with metastatic disease, then you have another 20% who fail local treatment, whose disease has either, uh, is either initially metastatic or else it recurs after definitive treatment. And in those patients, the, the usual sites of metastasis are the bone would be the, typically the most common one, and then after that, lymph glands would be another common one. In more aggressive cancers, you tend to, you can see spread to the liver, uh, to the brain sometimes, but they would be less common, usually in the more de-differentiated aggressive types of cancer. And the traditional treatment for, uh, the first line treatment for metastatic prostate cancer or recurrent is what they call androgen deprivation. So in other words, because many, not most, but not all, prostate cancers are fed by androgen, or, or their growth is, is driven by androgen, then by taking away the androgens, you can, act, you can um, in many cases, reduce their growth down to, to a much lower rate. Now, you don't cure anyone typically with uh, anti-androgen therapy whose disease has metastasized, but you can keep their uh, disease under control for uh, significant periods of time. So. In, in the old, in the, you know, in the, in the originally, this would have been done by castration, by orchidectomy. Now, that's not really practiced anymore. Um, nowadays, we have injections uh, which do the same job by working on the pituitary gland. Um, they LH or H agonist, and now there's an antagonist which send the, so they send the pituitary into overdrive, and the result of that is it stops producing um, testosterone. So. <laughs> And that, when people with metastatic disease, doing that on its own will often control the disease for a period for 18 months, two years, sometimes longer than that. Obviously has side effects, usually in terms of weight gain, loss of uh, muscle mass, um, change in mood, um, hot flushes, you know, the menopausal type symptoms that men wouldn't be used to having. Um, and that they, they would be the, usually typically last for the first six to 12 months of treatment, and then they often would wear off. Um, and then we've also begun to realize that as time goes on and people are living longer, that these injections also cause an increase in heart disease and stroke and diabetes, so many other complications that we didn't know about before. So typically the other thing to say is that once you start the antigen deprivation, typically 
you stay on that for the, for the remainder of your life. You don't ever come off it. And that reduces down the testosterone and other androgen levels in the body by about 90%. So, but it typically, after a while, what happens is you start to get a rise in the PSA again. And uh, PSA is typically the way we would monitor patients with disease. We can also do bone scans. We do PSA bone scans and we see the patient and see that they have pain. But typically after about a period of 18 months, two years, the androgen deprivation on its own stops to be effective. And we then have to start th thinking about adding in other treatments. Now, this is where the problem was up until recently, because we didn't really have very many good other treatments that we could slot into this area here. So we used to fiddle around with things like low doses of corticosteroids, which can reduce the androgen production in the adrenal gland. And we had there are alternatives like Casadex, which is a weak anti-androgen, which works at the, at the level of the androgen receptor and competitively binds with the androgens in the body. Um, um, but, you know, these, these are typically only tend to work for a short duration of time, typically a few months. And then there was chemotherapy, which has since for the last about 20 years um, has been shown to produce a survival benefit in, in, in patients with metastatic disease. The difficulty there is, as I was saying, showing you earlier, a lot of the patients are elderly and they're not really good candidates for chemotherapy. And if you think about a patient who has minimal symptoms and it's just that their PSA is rising, their bone scan may be a little bit worse, putting them on chemotherapy um, often uh, would be something that neither me as a clinician or the patient would have been that keen to do. So the, that model is probably changing now as we learn more about the disease. In other words, where chemotherapy fits into the paradigm, that's changing because we're beginning to understand the disease better. Um, but the traditional model would have been keep chemotherapy for as long as possible. Cyplisol T is not available in Ireland. It's available in a couple of um, countries in it's available in London now and in the US it's uh, it involves uh, inserting a large central line uh, taking off the patient's um, uh, lymphocytes and incubating them with prostate antigens and then reinfusing them so obviously a very uh, complicated treatment has managed to be licensed for showing a survival advantage of a couple of months um, but hasn't caught on, obviously, because it's quite uh, cumbersome. Docetaxel and cabazitaxel, two forms of chemotherapy. These are probably the two uh, newer, these are the three newest newer agents. Uh, alpha Radin, um, which is a, a, a form of radiation therapy. Enzalutamide, which is a novel antiandrogen, so it's similar but different to, to Casadex, which is bicalutamide and abiraterone, and they both work, those last two both work at the level of the androgens. So if we think that, the other thing is that as I mentioned at the beginning, most of the metastases in prostate cancer tend to be the bone. So um, because you're also putting people on uh, LHRH agonists, which take away their testosterone, it makes their bones weak. We would tend to keep people, as well as having them on androgen deprivation therapy, we would have them on something to protect their bones. That's either denosumab or Zometa. Okay, so uh, if we think back to, um, I worked in the Mara, as part of my training, I worked in the Marie Curie Institute in Paris, and they have a famous uh, photo there of a nurse holding a radioactive element, waiting to give it to pass it on to the doctor who's going to apply it to the forehead of uh, the patient with a lesion on the skin. Now, obviously, we've learned a lot about radiation. Michael's horrified there. <laughs> we've learned a lot about radiation since then. But this is the latest version of radiation. So it comes in a bottle. So this is actually uh, alpha radon, which is an alpha isotope. The beauty of this is that the penetration, and Michael can tell us a lot more about than me about this, but it's the penetration of the alpha particles are so little, it's blocked by a sheet of paper. So you can actually, there's very little, uh, there is protection required, obviously. But the beauty of this is, it, because it's in the same, um, it's radium-223, and you guys know better than I do. So that's in the same, ta it's the periodic table of the elements, it's in the same row as calcium. So it's attracted to the bone. So when it goes in, when you give it in intravenously, it goes uh, to the, it's tropic for bone. It goes to the bone, and it 
because its uh, its action is very short, it just it it would it, would, it, it tends to t kill off cancer cells without causing too much toxicity to the bone marrow itself. Now. But there are our older versions of this, which were beta emitters, and the big problem with them is they caused a lot of myelosuppression, um, whether it was low blood counts, low platelets, low hemoglobin. This one doesn't do that. So that is one new version, which we're now looking to combine. So now you could look, so can we combine this with, because radiation is very effective for pain in patients with bone metastasis. One of the big problems you get is pain. Radiation is very effective, so external beam radiation, you point at an area that's causing pain, typically the pain goes away. So can you give this injection into, into, the, into the vein and take those pain away? Yes, you can. And actually it also improves your survival. So this is one of the latest treatments in prostate cancer. And we're doing a study through ICORC of a combination of this drug and enzalutamide, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So, so that's one of the agents now that were really um, significant progress in the last number of years. And you can see that it's attracted to where the, where the metastases are in the bone. And as I was saying, the, it's a very short, uh, uh, it doesn't get very far, short range, therefore it doesn't cause much toxicity. So that's, that's good. Now the second agent I just wanted to talk about uh, is Zytiga or Aberaterone. So we know that the androgens within the body are produced at three different places. So they can be produced uh, in the testes, so we've taken care of that with the, our injection, which has turned off the, the, hype, the pituitary axis. The adrenal glands, and then within the tumor itself. So how do you, and the other thing is that the tumor becomes very sensitive to very low doses, to very low levels of androgens. So when you take away the, uh, the majority of the androgens, the tumor upregulates so that very small amounts of androgens can allow it to proliferate. So, uh, Zytiga is a, a, a lyase inhibitor that works at the level of the adrenal gland and interferes with uh, steroid biosynthesis. So it, it actually reduces the amount of androgens that are being produced within the adrenal gland. And <clears throat> it, one of the side effects that it has, it's an oral agent, tends to be quite well tolerated. It's, it has to be given with corticosteroids because it inhibits corticosteroid production as well. And if you give it uh, if you give it on its own without the steroid, we soon learned that you got a lot of diversion of the corticosteroid pathway into mineralocorticoid, and as a result of that would be a lot of fluid retention, hypertension, your blood pressure goes up, you lose uh, salts in you, uh, from your body. So it has to be given with corticosteroids, and that one of the reasons, so that's one of the reasons some people don't like to use it too early in the disease process, because Giving corticosteroids to people, obviously, they have their own set of side effects, whether it be, um, you know, bruising, uh, upsetting the stomach, upsetting the mood, a number of different things that people don't like about them. But a very effective agent in that it does quite, quite, quite effectively abrogate the production of the, the, t the androgens within the adrenal gland and has resulted in um, survival advantage for patients. Um, both pre-chemo, so the, the traditional model, as I was saying, is pre-chemo and post-chemo. So these agents have leapfrogged chemotherapy now so that they become that area where I said that uh, the, the injection on its own isn't working anymore. So this is where these agents are beginning to come into play. So rather than having to think about chemotherapy, we start thinking about th thinking <laughs> using something like Zytiga, whereby um, an oral agent Typical side effects are relatively mild, apart from the fact that you have to give steroids with it. It causes hypertension to a small degree. There's a slight increase in cardiac uh, disease. Um, there's a slight increase in fluid retention, but apart from that, it's very well tolerated. The biggest issue is you have to take it on empty stomach, so patients have to wake up early in the morning and take it, and then wait an hour before ha going to have their breakfast, but that's it. So it's a, good, it's a nice drug to be able to prescribe for people. Now it costs, it costs about 3,000 uh, euros a month. Um, but at the, and at the moment, up until recently, we were limited in, although it's licensed for use pre and post chemotherapy, we weren't allowed to use it by the NCCP, although I think that has actually changed um, in the last couple of weeks. I think it's been, we're now going to be allowed to use a pre chemotherapy. So a very effective agent and Survival advantage of a number of months when you combine when you when it's given to patients pre-chemotherapy, and 
when, once you're on it, it tends to be effective for over a year, sometimes 18 months, uh, uh, just on its own without you having to do anything else. So obviously, uh, it's a real step forward for us in terms of new agents for the disease. I suppose it makes sense when you think of a new agent and you see that it works in metastatic patients like this one does, um, the next logical step is can you bring it back in the disease process and, and treat people earlier and then maybe cure more people because that's of course what we, we want to do. We want to avoid this scenario where people have relapsed and have metastatic disease. We want to cure more people and that's exactly what's happening now. We're doing studies um, with abiraterone and radiation uh, through ICORG and we're also doing studies with enzalutamide which I'll talk about in a second and radiation in, in high risk patients in an attempt to try and cure more patients. So that's uh, not the latest, uh, that's uh, not the latest uh, marketing from Janssen who makes ITIGA, but it's, it's a point, it's the kind of thing you find out there on the internet. So the other, the other thing to say is that um, <coughs> the other drug is enzalutamide. So it uh, is different to the ITIGA in that it works a bit like the bicalutamide at the level of the antigen receptor, but also it works within the cell uh, uh, it has three different modes of action, but different to uh, the Zytiga or Abiraterone. So this is also an oral agent, which is uh, very well tolerated. Um, and Astellas uh, uh, have made this one. Um, and very similar data to, to the Zytiga in terms of uh, survival advantage for patients pre and post chemotherapy. Uh, and these agents have revolutionized the treatment of prostate cancer, I would say, in the last couple of years, because um, again, you're, have, you're going from an era where you, where you didn't really know what you were going to do next to an era now where you have these oral agents that people can take without a major impact on their quality of life. The biggest side effect of this agent would be fatigue. Now, that may not sound like much, but when you have a patient who's very well otherwise, fatigue actually can be annoying. And it's amazing when you see these people that. Um, how much fatigue can be troublesome for them. And that just shows you how good their quality of life is otherwise, because they're really obviously doing well. Their biggest problem is they can't do as much as they used to do before. It's not that, it's just, when you compare that to chemotherapy and the side effects that you might see with that, it's just your frame of reference. When I'm seeing 20 patients in the same situation, I'm thinking the way they could be. It's very hard to explain that to, a, to an individual patient though. But, um, a very well tolerated agent, oral, taken once a day, tends to be very well, other, other than the fatigue, there aren't too many um, side effects. You can see there's the mode of action. The three, there's a, there's, it works within the cell as well, um, prevents and inhibits uh, nuclear translocation and DNA transcription, as well as working at the level of the receptor. So we are, and there you can see from the Affirm, which is one of their biggest studies, that anything below the line is, is good. Um, you can see the effects on PSA um, that you can see with this drug. So we continue to monitor patients through the course of the illness with their PSA, with their scan, and with how they're doing. One of the issues that we have with prostate cancer is, is to know um, there are the occasional patients that are about 20% whose tumors don't make PSA. And it can be much more difficult to know how they're doing in terms of their disease if you don't have a PSA as a marker. So, uh, what did I want to say there? So the other thing that's happening in cancer, as you know, is the checkpoint inhibitors, um, which have really made a huge uh, difference um, in melanoma. And now we're seeing them. Uh, the last, we were getting press release, I'm sure some of you saw them, from the AACR uh, from recently about checkpoint inhibitors in lung cancer, um, checkpoint inhibitors in kidney cancer. So that's really where um, the action is in terms of What's, what's the latest thing in, 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 in cancer treatments. Um, so now we're, they're combining um, the PD-1 inhibitors, the PD-L1 inhibitors with the CTLA-4 inhibitors. So, and they seem to get an increased response rate and actually reduced toxicity. And the, thing, the nice thing about these agents is they tend to be durable responses, um, which is not something that is true uh, with many of the other agents. In other words, if you get a response to one of these agents, you may remain well for many, many months, even years uh, off treatment. So, I mean, that's a total change in the paradigm for anything that we've been used to. Even these agents, 
you have to stay on them. Once you stop them, the PSA starts to rise again. Um, or, uh, um, so they, uh, are, are sometimes they don't work at all. So I think that that's a huge uh, step forward. Now, we haven't seen any of those in prostate cancer with activity as yet. Um, we wait to see about that. But we certainly, in diseases which are traditionally very hard to treat, like lung cancer, um, um, to see activity like that is very encouraging. Um, Vincent would know about the lung cancer and the things I've not dealt with that for many years. But so, we're, so that's very encouraging. We're going off Tasco next week. We expect to hear more about that. Still leaves us with uh, uh, some gaps in terms of where we need to go in terms of prostate cancer and also pancreas cancer, but certainly uh, uh, a lot of hope on the horizon. One of the corollaries of that, of course, is how do we, how do we pay for these uh, drugs? Because I sit on the, one of the things that I do is I sit on the NCCP um, Drug Reimbursement Committee and uh, you know, back in the day when I started in Ireland, back in Ireland, which was in 2004, we, would, we, were, we were very privileged in that we would go to ASCO or one of our meetings and we would see the results of a very promising study and we would come back to Ireland and if the drug was already licensed, we'd start to use it or as soon as it got licensed, we would use it. And that was a great situation to be in. Unfortunately, the, con the fact there's so many new agents and there's so many pharmaceutical companies uh, focusing on these areas, that is not possible anymore. And of course, when, when, it, when we combine that with the, with the downturn in the, uh, in the economy, um, there had to be some sort of controls put into place in terms of who can prescribe what drug for what disease. And those, that is happening now. Uh, unfortunately, the, what has happened as a result is we have delays in terms of when we can use these drugs. Um, they do, no drug as yet has not been approved in Ireland, although there have been uh, significant delays for some of them. But when you think of the cost of them, you can understand. I mean, ipilimumab for melanoma as a single agent costs 90,000 euros per course of treatment. So that's um, if you treat 10, and one patient in 10 benefits. So, you, you know, you think about 900,000 to, to get one patient to benefit. It's a lot of money. So we have to work out a happy medium. How do we fix, how do we um, pick, make sure that we want access, to, we want to be able to treat our patients the effect of drugs on the one hand, but we don't want to be, uh, you know, we want it to, uh, to, the economy can't afford for us to be treating every patient with every drug. And the answer to that is we, in the ideal world, we have a biomarker which allows us to pick out the correct drug for the for correct patient. And that will be the way forward. Now, as yet, you know, Avastin, which is one of the drugs we've used for many years in colorectal cancer, where we have no way, with no biomarker for whether Avastin VEGF uh, inhibitor uh, is going to work in a particular patient. And in some ways, back in the day, it didn't suit pharmaceutical companies to have a biomarker because that reduced their market. Now I think that that's the opposite, as we were finding out more and more about individual tumors, next generation sequencing, you know, we're getting down to one and two percent. The, the ALK inhibitors in lung cancer, we're getting down to very small percentages, tumors which are being, you know, really characterized down to very small, uh, very finite amounts. I think it's all going to be about the, uh, the biomarker. So the next generation of studies, and we were talking about them yesterday with uh, ECOG, is the MATCH study where they're doing next generation sequencing on all tumors, and then depending on what they find, you get you get siphoned off into 11 different arms, I think, uh, of the, and there's a different drug in each arm, um, depending on what the mutation is that they found. So it's completely different to the clinical trials that we used to do where we stick everyone in together and give everyone the same treatment and see what comes out at the end. This is completely different. So we have to, in my other role as head of ICOR, we have to adapt to that. First of all, we have to be able to test the tumors, and secondly, we have to be able to give the treatment and not every hospital can give those treatments. So we have to adapt a referral system where, you know, I might treat one type of tumor or someone else would treat a different type and so on. So that's the future. We're probably a few years away from that yet. But I suppose, I think I'm running out of my time here. But the message I want to give you is there is progress in prostate cancer. But, and it's great to see that we're curing more patients. But I suppose we have to find out the best treatments for a given individual patients. And one way we're doing that here, we have a grant from the Cancer Society
for prostate cancer patients where we're doing profiling on each individual patient trying to work out which is the best uh, treatment for an individual patient given that we now have a range of treatments available to us. So what I was saying to you is about the chemotherapy, we used to keep it till the end. Now we're saying, okay, maybe there are patients where we should be giving it right up front because they're going to respond better to chemotherapy than they are to some of these newer agents. But we just don't know that. We have, there's ways that I can, from using my experience from treating lots of patients, I can probably pick you out 10% of patients who aren't going to do well and maybe we should be doing that. But there's a better way than that. So that's what we're trying to, to figure out as we go along. So I think I'll stop there because I've run out of time. So uh, does anyone have any questions? I don't think so. I think that's kind of gone out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. The cat is out of the bag, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The cat is out of the bag, I think. It's because it's so easy to do, do you know? It's not like cervical screening or, you know, you're not, or bowel screening, you know, even those, they have a certain barrier associated. Most patients would be willing to have a blood test. I think a lot of the, in England, in the UK, the far, you can go into Boots and get it done. So, um, it's hard to go, I don't think you can put that genie back in the bag, the bottle. Yeah. Uh, I have just a question, you were mentioning the different, uh, the new treatments that are available for hmm. cancer. It, um, if one doesn't work, does that hmm. signify for a later one? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, so, so, the, so for hormonal treatment, I think that's true. Yeah, the more, if the front, it's less likely. And they're now doing that on the basis of, so the la, at last year's ASCO, there was a presentation. So rather than having to biopsy patients, they can now do, you can do testing for ARV mutations. So antigen receptor mutations in the blood, a circulating tumor cells. And you can tell whether someone's going to respond or not from that. And that isn't commercially available yet. But yeah, the one thing that has become very clear is if the first hormonal treatment doesn't work, it's much less likely the next one will. And that's the type of patient I'm talking about that maybe you should be bringing chemotherapy up front or alpha radon up front. Okay. And so that's really bad news if the hormonal treatment not It's not good news, no. But there are always, then you have to look at the type of cancer. You know, there are these neuroendocrine type cancers, which are a different type. You have to look at that, and there are different ways of approaching those. So it's just about how you approach it rather than. And then is there chemotreatment after the hormone? There is. I didn't get into that. But there are other, there is a new chemotherapy agent, cabazitaxel, which is also in use. But we, there's no question we need other agents which aren't hormonal based or else that can reverse hormonal resistance. And people are looking at that. But also we need other agents that. Uh, have a, because there's a big area there where we have nothing at the moment. Okay. With bone cancer, sorry, yeah. bone cancer, um, following on from prostate cancer, yeah. and is it usually in the around the pelvic area? That, that would be a typical to start. Yeah, then the, the vertebrae would be another common area. And when is it in the around, do they think that um, chemotherapy then so that's one thing that has changed in, in the last year. So we've, there was a study at, la, at last year's ASCO and another one at this year's ASCO. So patients, those 20% who I said who present with metastatic disease, so now we're using chemotherapy up front in those patients just for a short period of time and then we leave them on the hormonal treatment. So that's something that's changed in the last 12 months. That's going to be even up until now, till the last week, that would have been still a little bit controversial, but there's another study going to be presented next week which confirms that that's the right thing to do. So that's the point. I think that makes you think about what, where, where should chemotherapy be fit, and it shouldn't be like stuffed at the end. It should be based on individual patient characteristics. Yeah? What, what is the purpose of that chemo with upfront? It delays. It, so there was a 17-month survival advantage for patients who got the chemotherapy in that 17-month. 
So it, it delays progression of disease. You know this thing, the little spike where I was showing that the dis so it delay it pushes that further down the line. Probably you just kill off more clones of cancer. You have a, lo a lower disease burden, less chance of takes it longer to start getting uh, new mechanisms of resistance. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, don't understand. So that's these, uh, these newer, they're immune based treatments which work on. So you have immune tolerance, which allows us to, you know, and tumors will often thrive on that. So we should be recognizing, your immune system should be recognizing these as foreign. They're not normally expressed. So your, your immune system has become tolerant to this. So it's to try and ramp those up again. So the, the, the checkpoints are the areas where normally your immune system would be saying, okay, that's all right, we'll let that pass. We won't let this pass. So you're trying to unblock those. 